Now, there's a big dilemma currently happening with large corporations, and I want to start with large corporations, then I go on to startups, and then to universities, and then put it all together. So you, the large corporations, every single big company, whether that is IBM, or whether that is Siemens, or any of the other companies, was small at one point, right? So we started with some innovation, we started with some uh, research, with something which is really a product which is able to grow. These were the heydays. The market was just forming. There were large margins, uh, large profits, etc. Time goes by, and the system changes. The ecosystem changes. Companies essentially enter markets which are highly competitive. Uh, you have typically competitive growing over time, so therefore your profit margins go down. Uh, the other issue is that clearly there is a certain maturity of the market, so your product sooner or later becomes a commodity item. And then the third problem is, is investors want their cash back, right? So they're happy to sit for some five years, for some 10 years, watch the company grow, but once it's a big corporation, they want their money back. So suddenly, all the money which uh, initially over the early years was flowing into the growth of the company, into the innovation, is drying out. And we see that I've been part of Orange, of France Telecom. I worked directly with the CEO and CTO there when telecommunications became commodity. It was a Ferrari in the industry and suddenly became just a normal car, right? So that's a massive transformation in our R&D department was shrank down from something really important to something which basically was just a vitrine. And many large corporations which had really important R&D departments end up having uh, only vitrines. So the question is, how do they stay in the innovation cycle? Very simple. They acquire. So there's a shift. Instead of innovating in-house, they rather like the market to innovate and use the cash essentially to acquire companies who might be very expensive. So you hear of acquisitions of $200 million, a $1 billion, $16 billion, and you think that's a lot of money. But if you actually translate that to a possible in-house cost to replicate what these companies have been doing, developing the product, getting all the customers, uh, having really the whole market opening and penetration, that is likely so much more expensive. So companies who really want to stay at the forefront of innovation, at the really cutting edge of development, uh, they need to acquire companies. And that is really what is currently the trend in the United States as well as the UK. And I presume that will uh, go further eastward. Now let me move on to startups. Now I have built a company from zero. I've been bleeding the whole thing. Uh, you read a lot of stuff. You read a lot of stuff from people who have never actually built a company. So once you're bleeding, it's just a totally different story. And I presume we will hear more about this later on. Um, companies have, startups have to go through three critical points, in my opinion. The first point, the first milestone, is the milestone of no return, right? So that's the point where essentially you know, you have, before you've been playing around, you had an idea, you're doing a small prototype, you're showing it to friends, you're talking to people, etc. But this is not what gets you going. You still can go back and say, hey, I go to my daytime job, I do something else. Um, the point of not return means you've taken on some investment. Maybe it's your government. Maybe it is an investor. Maybe it's family. Maybe you have publicized that quite a lot. But it's a point where you yourself would feel just extraordinarily embarrassed of saying, you know, I just let it go. So that's a, a psychologically a very important point to get going and build the team and get the thing going. The second important point is the transition from a prototype company to a product company. And that probably is the most painful transition and the transition I see most companies fail because to build a prototype around your idea as of 2015 is very simple, really simple. I just give you the example of the Internet of Things. Those who are skilled in the arts, they know you take an Arduino platform, you, need, you take some web services, you put things in here together between Friday evening that you have the idea in the pub and Sunday night you have a product, a prototype up and running. You can show that, okay? It works, and, uh, but this is not what gets you going. Uh, you need a real product. You need a product which is able to live for 10 years, uh, 
so you're minimizing customer service. There's a proper a market product match. There's a lot of exercise which needs to be done, and that's a transition which is particularly difficult to people coming out of university because they're used to stay in the prototyping phase. You can't do that. The real world requires a product. So that was phase number two. Milestone number three is the transition from a product-based company to market-driven company, okay? If after a few years your company still has the majority engineers, you know this is not going to work out, okay? Market-driven means you need to sell. You need salespeople, marketing people, etc., etc. I see that again and again that companies fail on that because they love their product. They want to optimize it. They want to make it nicer, better, more sexy, but they're losing time because what they should be doing is selling this stuff, right? So therefore, that is really important. I'm watching out on that when I'm doing all the mentoring in, the, in London on these, on these three points. So what do I tell my people there? I tell them, you're doing a few mistakes, and mistake number one maybe, or you know, the recommendation number one I give them is, you know, you should know the name and the surname of the person who's gonna buy your product before you start actually developing it. A lot of people don't know. They just have this fantastic idea. No doubt, it's great. It's a great utility. There's a good business model on an Excel sheet, but to really get it off the ground, you need to have somebody on the end who actually takes out a check and pays for that, right? If you don't know the name and the surname, you're lost. My recommendation number two is that you're typically just trying to be too perfect, okay? Because we love it. We want to have the best product going out. And uh, the notion of a minimum viable product is something which is still very alien to a lot of companies. So, and the reason is because they come out of university, they come out of a tech, uh, tech uh, environment, etc., and they don't dare. And I give them the example, think of like a football game. Think of Messi, right? So I presume you know Lionel Messi. If Lionel Messi only shoot it out of perfect situation, meaning, you know, it's a penalty situation with no goalkeeper. That would be easy, but this is not what real life is about. He scores out of the impossible situation, and that's exactly what you need to do. Start to score with a product which is not necessarily perfect, okay? And the third recommendation I give, guys, you're too much in love with what you're doing. You love too much your product. Uh, Things move on. If there's something else which actually works better, is more efficient, more cheaper, dump what you have done internally and outsource it. Take it from somebody else. Your ultimate market, uh, your ultimate vision is to build a market, to build a product which sells, right? So, and I've experienced that myself hands on when World Sensing, we have been developing hands on radios, multi-hop radios, I figured out it doesn't work. As CTO, I said, we need to dump this. This was 2 million euros, uh, which essentially I said, we're gonna bin it away overnight. We had a big fight, I had my way, and that's why the company is alive. So sometimes you have to do that, okay? Um, Overall, companies suffer from cash flow problems, and maybe we're going to hear a little bit about this later on. You know, B2B, business to business, it's because sales cycles are very long. So my company specializes in smart city sales. Between knocking on the door of the town hall and getting the first check, sometimes six years, right? So I have to pay 50 people salary for six years with not a single P coming in. Now that's a cash flow problem. And all everybody who runs a B2B business here, they know B2C is different. You need a lot of cash because you need to reach market, if through marketing, you need, re, need to reach people, etc. So there are different challenges here and raising cash is a totally different story in different countries. So I, you know, World Sensing grew out of Barcelona, Southern Europe, and uh, to raise cap capital there from the venture capitalists is, a, is an experience, right? So what they typically, they give you 100,000 euros for something which, has, which works and has clients, right? So I told them, guys, why do you give us money? There's no venture in there, there's, there's nothing. You're not risking anything, you're acting as a bank. So Southern Europe is really problematic for raising capital. London is different, UK is very different. It's an order of magnitude, factor one to 10. So we, instead of 100,000, I get a million and I can show a prototype, maybe with some customers interested, but not necessarily sales going. US is totally different yet, and uh, not sure it's a better model, but they get maybe $10 million with a PowerPoint, right? So our, our competitors, essentially, in the markets, who, by the way, didn't make it in the end, got 10 million pounds for showing a PowerPoint. So that's the United States um, uh, VC scenario in Silicon Valley. It's not bad because in the end, it's not the first move advantage which gets you out in the market. That's a big misconception. So having the idea first means nothing. 
okay? It's the first to be able to scale advantage, which really makes a difference. And for that, you're either really lucky or you need a lot of capital to get it going. Okay, but overall, everybody is in the room, and uh, you know, some of you are entrepreneurs. I was told others maybe are inspiring entrepreneurs. You should try it. It's a it's a fantastic experience. People talk about failure of starting companies. I don't agree. Anybody who starts a company, you learn, and you give people employment. I'm extraordinarily proud of having given people eight years, uh, 50 people eight years uh, money they can bring home and feed their families. There's a strong social uh, component to this, which I think everybody should be proud of, whether the company lives on or doesn't live on. Okay, so let me move on now to universities, a world I understand pretty well because I'm, uh, for the worst of the best, a university professor at the moment. And universities, at least in the United Kingdom, try to become entrepreneurial. Whether that is a good thing or a bad thing, ethically speaking, something we need to change the chart of universities, I'll leave that to you to discuss. Uh, what I do know is that there's a huge potential of making this work. Okay, universities have all the talent they need. Brilliant minds. We have people who are doing a Series A fundraising every year. Okay, that's what we do when we ask for grants, whether that's grants from the government or grants from somebody else, from the European Commission. We are filling in documentation. It's our business plan. We're submitting it year by year. Okay, so we're really talented in that. And actually, what I appreciated most from the people at university is that they understand the concept of deadline, okay? At least the word dead in deadline. <laughs> Meaning there's a line you can't actually overcome, right? So all our other people we hired, they really struggled with that. University people, we know how to handle it. So why isn't it happening? Well, universities do a lot of mistakes and King's hired me partially to address precisely that problem. So the first problem uh, universities do is they think the idea is everything. So they put everything on patenting. You know, they have an idea, take the academic, patent one, two, three patents, and then that patent is languishing around. Nobody's doing anything for that because there are no mechanisms streamlined to make anything out of this patent, right? So most of the patents just get lost. It happened in my case, so I had some pioneering patent for 4G. If you use 4G technology, some of this stuff was invented by me. King's College patented it, and five years before it really became important, they dropped it. How stupid is that, right? And that's what universities do because there's no mechanism in place. So there's too much emphasis on actually the very beginning. And those who are entrepreneurs, they know beginning is important, but that's just 0.01% of the journey. Then it's a long road and you're gonna pivot all the time because the market will want something else which you initially had in mind, okay? So therefore, that's mistake number one, and we're trying to change that. I tell people, you know, don't focus so much on patenting, focus more on the roadmap. Mistake number two is they think because they own the academic, they have to own any startup or any company which comes out of university. So you see silly configurations like 50% belongs to the entrepreneur, the academic, and 50% belongs to university. So what is that, okay? 50%, so if I'm an entrepreneur, there's somebody here beside me, 50%, I don't know even who that is. And imagine you're an investor, right? Some investors are in this room. Would you invest in something which belongs 50% to something you don't even have a face, you have no accountability, you don't really know how to call? It doesn't work. So we're pushing through this concept now of the golden share, where the university would take a share of that. They have a right of doing that. They should take that, right? They give uh, all the, all the uh, ingredients to make that happen. But it's kind of 3%. 5%, non-delusive, until a certain nominal value, 100 million pounds, 500 million pounds, depends on the area, whether it's IT, whether it's health, et cetera, et cetera. And that is much more attractive because nobody feels threatened whilst the university makes its cash still on the long run. And um, so that's mistake number two. Mistake number three is they think just giving the academic the opportunity of doing this is all what matters. It's not really true. Academics, we know how to write papers, we know how to write books, we know how to do research, we have no clue how to build a company. We need a logbook, right? We need essentially instructions. They're just missing, there's nothing there. We need an incentive. 
You know, so we are pushing for this now in Kings to get this entrepreneur and resident status, which puts that at the same level as citations or number of journal papers. And I think that is really important to nurture this entrepreneurial culture in universities. Yeah? And maybe the fourth mistake, and one of the biggest mistakes, not only done by universities, is uh, they think they can do it alone, so they wouldn't let anybody in. So King's College wouldn't let an Imperial College or UCL, uh, etc. which is not true. Everybody who's done entrepreneurship knows no matter how broad your skill base, you will always need some foreign talent. So you need to open up. You need other university, other skill sets, other tech guys to come in and do you that company. It's really, really important. Okay? What else is important? I think the... Um, the innovation clusters are really important. And uh, maybe I'm going to link this here to the cities because I have a lot of experience working with cities for my company, also for King's College. But, uh, and maybe Riga is a good place for that. You need literally things closely together. Okay, that's really important. Uh, driving distance is okay, walking distance is better. Yeah, you need to have these people in one pot, have a coffee together, talk, etc. Build this up here in Riga and you will succeed because just having that dynamic plus the capital plus the intellectual capabilities of this city will essentially leverage on that and make essentially the, the ecosystem grow. So that's very important. Bring together universities, bring together VCs, bring together research centers, accelerators, incubators, whatever it takes really to make this happen, just put them together. There is no first order business model for that. There is not. I cannot tell you if you put these five players together, in 10 years time you will have 10, 10 billion companies. We can't do that. But there's a second order gain here, okay? People are talking to each other. It's a social thing, network. Um, you know, it's a human interaction thing. And those who build companies know that's really important. So do that. That's why Silicon Valley works. That's why Tel Aviv works. That's why Berlin starts to work. That's why London works. Barcelona works. Because it's all together in a single ecosystem, right? And we have trialed this out with the smart city market. And smart cities, maybe you're going to be talking about this a little later on. I'll be, unfortunately, on the way back already to London. But uh, smart cities is a term which uh, has been kind of almost overused. I think there are more smart city experts or smart city PowerPoints on the planet than smart cities themselves, which is a rather uh, sad state to be in. It's become an urban philosophy rather than something hands-on. And we see that cities where you have these clusters together really work because all the other cities they still have the separation between smart and cities okay that's the biggest challenge really to bring this together the smart guys are the IBM's the Cisco's uh, you know the world sensings whatever you have and then you have the city guys companies like NSL uh, Swarco you've never heard of them right but these are billion dollar companies who own the city what do they do they, they draw lines they put parking machines, they, they put pipes, they maintain things. You don't hear them because they're not sexy, but they own the city. They don't want the smart guys, the IBMs and the Cisco, suddenly to come in and tell them how to run their business they have been running for the past 4,000 years, right? Doesn't make sense. That's why we have that friction. And world sensing at the very beginning was talking a lot to the Cisco's and IBM's until we realized that's a wrong party to talk to. Remember my name and surname? They were not the one who were willing to pay the check. It was NSL and Swarku who were. So we went underground, right? Off the press, everything, you know, there's nothing sexy about talking to these companies, but we get essentially our paycheck and I can maintain my people and grow the company. That's really important. So that to bring that together, the city side, and the smart side, I think, is the biggest challenge of the 21st century. And only when that happens is when we will have smart cities emerge, essentially. Okay? So let me just finish off with one thing just to remind you, really. Uh, and I'm saying this again and again. So mathematically speaking, there's very little you can do. If you want to start something, uh, whether it's a smart city project, whether it's your company, etc., you, know, you want to own it 100%, most likely you will not succeed. 100% sounds very attractive, but will be zero. 100% of zero is zero. Nothing we can do about it, okay? Share. 50% of something is more than that. 20, 25% of even more than that is even more than that. 
right? So therefore, the, the mentality has to change. It has to be a sharing mentality. It has a, a work together mentality, a collaboration mentality, which is why the innovation hubs are important, whether you're tackling smart agriculture, whether you're tackling smart cities, or anything else you want to do, okay? And I urge you, if you haven't done it, even you, Mr. President, if you haven't done a company, do it. It's great, right? It's like, jumping off the cliff, as they say, and, uh, you know, assemble the airplane on the way down. And often, you don't even have instructions. Uh, I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much.